Hello, everyone, and welcome back to 305 Insights. I'm your host, Alan Summerton, and today we're going to be talking about the Florida State Seminoles versus the Duke Blue Devils. And folks, history was finally made. The Knolls have finally lost a game to the Duke football program ending a 22-game winning streak against the Blue Devils. Final score, 23-16. to And there's, there's a lot to digest from this game. And FSU is now 1-6 on the season. And the future is looking dimmer and dimmer with each passing game. You you wanted to hope that the change in quarterback would lead to something different. You were hoping that transitioning towards a younger offensive core and defensive, just the youth movement was starting to take its effect. And the result is still the same. However... There are some good things to take away from this game. And I guess we'll start off with the positive because, you know, we want to try and start it off lighthearted. The defense played pretty solid tonight. Um, Outside of a few plays where the edge wasn't set and no sacks from the QB, it was a good effort overall by, you know, the defensive side of the ball. Duke only managed uh, 180 yards of total offense. And you got Malik Murphy going 12 of 24 for 70 yards. That's a 2.9 yard average per completion. And the team had 110 yards on 35 attempts for a 3.1 yard average. And again, Star Thomas had 21 for 88 with a touchdown. But if you take away that one 44-yard catch that happened after uh, Barker was called for the holding and Shaheen Brown got the interception that was overturned, obviously because of the penalty, if you take away that 44-yard run, the team had 34 carries for 66 yards. It's a 1.9 yards per carry. So, again, overall, just a a good effort by the defense when you measure it in the sense of what they didn't allow Duke to do. And unfortunately it was a game of Duke playing keep away, which is why they ran the ball so much and they didn't try to pass as much because there's a lot of self-inflicted wounds by the Seminoles, but you did have six tackle for losses and eight pass deflections. So that, that was really good. Justin Cryer, had uh, two tackles for losses, and he's really shown a lot these past few games. Omar Graham Jr., I know he's gotten a lot of flack, but he had a half a tackle for loss. Patrick Payton, half a tackle for loss. Barker, half a tackle for loss. Daniel Lyons, Fentrell Cypress, Edwin Joseph. And then with the pass deflections, K.J. Kirkland, Grady Kelly. Uh, Fentrell Cypress had two. Cam Riley had one. Darrell Jackson Jr. had one. Zaria Thomas had one. Kevin Knowles had one. So just uh, – and overall, it's one of the better performances by this defense. Again, you can't honestly ask for much more when you're out on the field for thirty over 30 minutes, 30 and a half minutes. And, again, you, you really – only 50% completion, basically 12-24. Again – 35 rushing attempts, you only allow 3.1 yards. So third down efficiency, Duke went 3 of 17. They're 1 of 1 on fourth down. They had only 10 first downs on the game. Again, this this was just one of those things where the, the defense did everything that they could. And if you look at the Duke possessions that weren't following a Florida state turnover three and out four plays and a punt three and out, three and out, three and out, three and out halftime field goal, 
three and out, five plays, punt, field goal, three and out, and then the end of the game. That's insane. Great performance by the defense in that matter, but you allowed 17 points off of turnovers, and that's not entirely your fault. So we'll get to that in a bit. Special teams, once again, a bright spot. Sam Singleton, a young kid, delivered a 95-yard TD return. He also had uh, four returns in total for 165 yards. So overall, he was before he broke that TD, uh, I was really impressed with how not only were they returning the ball with him on kickoffs, but, you know, how much, how efficiently he was using the space that was provided for him. So, and again, he broke that long run. Uh, Fitzgerald had two field goals over 45 yards and Master Mono once again had a masterful performance, four punts, three inside the 20. He averaged 50.8 yards per punt. So, yeah, that's about, I mean, and and I guess, you know, we could put Cam Davis in there. I know he had the fumble, but here's a a fun fact for you. On the season, he has 131 rushing yards, and he has 134 yards after contact. Do you know what that means? That means on average... Cam Davis is getting hit 0.1 yards behind line of scrimmage this season. And he still has 131 rushing yards. So kudos to that kid. I know he had the fumble, which killed a lot of momentum on that drive. But overall, you know, 14 of 63, four and a half yards per average. Brock Glenn had a pretty solid running game, 9 of 47 outside of all the times he was sacked. I'm sure that would be higher without the sacks. Morlock had one rush for 31 yards on that trick play for the punt. Lawrence Tofili had nine of 23, but he also had four receptions for 39 yards. Uh, Ja'Kai Douglas had four for 48. Hakeem had two for 18. Kentron had one. Portier had one for 17. And Malik Benson had one for seven. And yeah, uh, Brocklin lost a fumble. Cam Davis lost a fumble. Um, the bad. I am not exaggerating when I say this, folks. The offense could have knelt the whole knelt the ball as a play. Just take a knee every single play for the whole game, and they would have won seven to six. Duke scored 17 points off turnovers. I believe FSU was the first FBS team to turn the ball over on three straight plays. I'm not talking about three straight possessions. You throw a pick six, and then I believe he fumbled it, and then he threw a pick on the next play that they had the ball. So there's a reason why Luke Cronoke went into the game. Um, Also, real quick, you you know what? We'll tie that in later. Um, Yeah. Coming off a bye week, you don't score an offensive touchdown. Norvell is supposed to be... Uh, a really good offensive mind. You've seen his teams at Memphis and his teams in FSU have the ability to score on a consistent basis. But ever since Travis, Jordan Travis went down, this team cannot get over 300 yards of total offense. And you figured in this game with the rushing attack, discounting sacks, You had a total of 207 yards. You lost 45 yards for a total of a, sorry, for a total of 162 yards. So you finished with a 4.1 yards per carry with factoring all the sacks. You figure that if you have 162 yards of rushing, you can manage to get the other 138 yards in the air to finally break that mythical 300 yards of total offense. And you can't do that because you have 129 passing yards. Now, now that we've gotten to that part with the passing yards, it has become a tired act at this point to see 
the amount of drops that this wide receiving core has. Luke Crono comes into the game and throws a beautiful, beautiful 55-yard pass in the air, drops it on a dime to Kentron Portier, drops it right into the breadbasket, and Portier drops it. Now, we waited on the replay to maybe, oh, maybe one of the um, safety or defensive backs, cornerbacks or whatever, but just defensive backs in general, maybe they got a hand on him and, and pulled his hand and caused the ball to go to the ground. Nope, they didn't touch him. He created just enough separation at the very end to get both his hands up to basically make a basket and catch it in his chest, and it hits off his arm. Crono knew it was a good pass and was celebrating and then realized he dropped it, and that was that. Uh, I believe it was Luke as well who threw a nice pass to Hakeem Williams who absolutely alligator-armed that ball, and he did not want to get hit by the safety crossing over. And again, that was a critical play where he would have gotten a, ma- a chunk yardage and it would have set up the team for probably a field goal at least. But again, you missed out on a touchdown. You missed out on a field goal. Just a, a, a lot going on with the drops again. And you had uh, Malik Benson had a drop as well. So that killed the momentum that you had from the fake punt. And Jalen Brown had a really bad game. You know, and this is one of the young guys. Again, he's a transfer, but again, he's a wretched freshman. And if not, he's a sophomore, true sophomore. But he had the block in the back, so that caused a 10-yard penalty. And then the, the play where they made Brock throw across the field on the curl route on third and 10, and Jalen Brown really didn't make an effort, as much of an effort as I thought, to come back to the ball and allow the Duke player to intercept it. And then he really did not make a great effort to tackle him to prevent the pick six. And just, I don't know. It's just it, it's just crazy that Once you saw the number one of Kentron Portier, you had a feeling that he wasn't going to come down with that ball from Luke. And that would have been, and in terms of airtime, that would have been one of the better passes in recent memory for FSU. And it would have been his first completed pass. It just would have been beautiful. Absolutely beautiful. But, Again, just it just sucks. There's no preparation by this team. And there's no execution at the right moments. You have... I mean, you have four turnovers. That just immediately puts you in the worst position possible. You're 2 of 14 on third down. You're just not doing anything efficiently. You're 9 of 65 on penalties. So you out-penalized Duke. They had 5 for 44. So you have an equal number. Like I said, four turnovers. You had two interceptions, two fumbles. It's just over, like, what what is this coaching staff doing during the bye week? This is one of your games that was winnable to at least make this season a a three-win season, a four-win season maybe with North Carolina and and, and Florida not counting Charleston Southern. This, this is an embarrassment on so many levels because of the fact that Duke has never beaten you as a football program and even in your worst years. And... They managed to do it here. Mike Norvell is 
at a loss right now what to do with this team. And that's not what you want to say about your coach. I don't know if it was the... And, and there was an article written by Brennan Sinone, I believe, on Knowles 247 talking about the timeline of what happened in the offseason about who they're getting in the transfer portal and how they thought, you know, certain people will come here for less money because of what they've done. And there's a lot of miscalculations in the off season, but the fundamental issue that I think they have here is that Mike Norvell was preaching about the climb, the climb, the climb, and something and I don't want to be overly dramatic with this, but it, it seems as almost something within him broke, like his spirit broke or his ability to, you know, be this guy who was able to lead this team to 23 wins over a two year period is it. We, we're not seeing, we're seeing, seeing a shell of a man right now. And it doesn't help that he has, a coaching staff that isn't prepared to step up. He doubled down on these guys and they're not helping. The wide receivers can't catch a ball. The offensive line cannot block. I mean, Jeremiah Byers in the last like drive of that game was getting absolutely destroyed by that Duke defensive end. I mean, it was laughable. I was watching the game and just, I was screaming at them to send help. And they finally sent help. I think Toa Feely was blocking. They couldn't even, you know, put out a bunch of wide receivers. You know, they had to keep a a running back in there as like a chip blocker because, and it wasn't even like spin moves or, Poles or anything fancy. He just bull rushed him every single time. That's technique. The man literally just pushes you and that's it. He just overpowers you. And you're a 320 pound, 315 pound man, six foot three. You know, you're a redshirt junior, or a redshirt senior, I think. And, and you're getting pushed around like that. Like just, Again, the Cam Davis said he's getting hit 0.1 yards behind uh, the line of scrimmage or whatever it was before he he's able to, like, he's breaking tackles basically right when he gets the ball. Oh, I don't know, a voice there. Right when he gets the ball. It's it's just, it's, it's severely disappointing that the team can't make adjustments. Mike Norvell can't make adjustments in realizing that this isn't the team that you went into this season thinking – and we've said this repeatedly on this podcast. They thought they would be a power running team that can go vertical with Benson and Brown and maybe Hakeem Williams and, and Ja'Kai Douglas and all these guys. Like, you know, just, just go vertical, use DJ's arm. That clearly hasn't worked for the first six games. And going into the seventh game, you did the same thing pretty much. Like, your quarterback doesn't have time to throw the ball. And not only that, you have young quarterbacks. You you threw in a red shirts uh, freshman and a true freshman. And they were fighting for their lives a lot of the plays. Like, they took some serious hits. And again, sometimes Brock didn't step up when he needed to in the pocket. He didn't run when he should have, but... Again, that shouldn't be his responsibility to run all the time. And it's just poor, poor game planning. And it's just not, like I said at the beginning, it's not, it's looking dimmer and dimmer for any sort of hope. The only reason, besides my passion and love for this team as to why I continue watching them, is to see what we have for the future. Do we have the quarterback we need on this roster? Can we decide on that with Brock Glenn? Or are we just going to hand the reins immediately to Luke and Brock's going to transfer out and we're stuck with nobody as the backup? A bunch of young guys and we're going to have to get another transfer in 
who's willing to sit behind a, a true freshman. Well, he's going to be a sophomore next year or a redshirt freshman next year. And Luke, is Brock willing to come back unless he doesn't have a guaranteed gig? I'm not saying that he should, but again, you're going to have to do a lot of uh, mixing and matching if, if, if you can't figure out who your QB of the future is. And it's starting to get concerning with that in the sense of, yeah, you had, you know, you had the likes of Jordan Travis for so many years, but I, it's just crazy. And it it's just unfortunate because there hasn't been any development at that position. Not that you needed it in the sense because you had Jordan Travis, but again, where was the succession plan? That's what I want to know because clearly Tate Rodmaker wasn't it. That's why he left. And... I mean, who else? You you had AJ Duffy. You had well, Luke Altmeyer was committed to us, and then he left for Ole Miss, and now he's at Illinois. But yeah, it's just one of those things where where, where what's been developed by this coaching staff on the QB side. What makes you think that we're gonna have? that ability from this team. I, I just don't, it, it just makes you wonder, like, do you have the hope? Like Tate Rodmaker, he's not even playing at Southern Miss right now. I believe that's where he is. You had, again, AJ Duffy. He's not playing at San Diego State University now. Chubba Purdy, he wasn't good enough to play anywhere, I don't think. And then Brock Len is like, are you? I thought I, I think there's enough bright spots with Brock to to have something in the future, but it's harder and harder to justify it when he turns the ball over three straight plays. This was finally the opportunity for him to show what he's made of in the sense of you don't have to deal with Georgia's defense, you don't have to deal with the top fifteen opponent in Louisville in the ACC championship game, you don't have to deal with Clemson's defense. This was your opportunity. This is your first opponent that you faced that not only wasn't ranked in the top 15, but wasn't ranked, period. And that's the game you put up. It's It doesn't inspire confidence. 9 of 19 for 110 yards and two picks. Again, you have the 47 yards of rushing to go by, but... We need we need efficient passing. There's there's too many athletes on this team to not be competent at offense. The wide receiver room is a lot more of a disappointment than even the most diehard members of the fan base thought it'd be. Blake Benson has been pretty bad, if not awful. Jalen Brown hasn't been good. There's your two transfers that you had coming in. The older guys. Ja'Kai Douglas is the only guy that can catch a ball. And when the only guy that can catch a ball is 5'9", 165 pounds. I'm sorry, 195 pounds. I short change in 30 pounds there. That, that's not looking good. Hakeem Williams has been injured, and when he's been on, like he does okay blocking wise, and then you know this is a big moment for him, and he joins the group in dropping balls. You know where where were the tight ends? Nothing from Kyle Morlock, obviously, but Landon Thomas had a great receiving game against Clemson. I believe it's comes from right. He had 80 yards receiving, and he was your top offensive threat. Amari Williams had a touchdown grab. No side of them in terms of getting them thoroughly involved in the game plan. Just 
concerning, folks. It, it it's just concerning in the sense that the energy from this team is just on the offensive side. The defense is is trying their best to be respectable. And although they may not execute properly, and we'll see how bad it gets against the UM this week because UM can actually throw the ball and run the ball. Um, this could be a bloodbath for the ages. If you remember correctly, a few years ago it was like what forty-five to three, but FSU really didn't try to score that much in the fourth quarter, if at all, in the second half. If you're an FSU fan, you have to hope that Mario Cristobal and company had that same mindset of just like, let's just run the ball a lot in the fourth quarter because I think the line opened up as uh 20 at Circa sports. Uh, I'm doing a quick check because I knew that off the top of my head, but I'm, I know hard rock didn't have the lines out yet. I'm doing a quick check to see it should be out now. Buying time as I'm scrolling. But we'll see. I mean, it's it, they're definitely a huge underdog. I mean, basically three touchdown underdogs. But the local Hard Rock bet has Miami as a 21.5 point favorite. That's tough, folks. So uh, we'll preview that game. Basically, in the halfway reviews, I wasn't able to get to that last week, but we'll try and get to that this week and pump out that content of how we view the halfway point of the season for FSU and UM. And we'll probably just combine that into one preview of both both the teams as well as what we expect to happen in that game, but I think it's fairly obvious. So... And then we'll also review uh, this week's past uh, college football results because it was another event-filled weekend. A lot of interesting games happened. So we'll review those. So as we end to, as we end, wow. As we near the end of this episode, there we go. Got that one right. You guys know the drill. Apple Podcast. Spotify, YouTube. Those are where you can find us. Don't forget to like, subscribe, follow, turn on notifications, do all the good stuff, give the feedback if you want, see you know what more we can offer. Trying to pump out that college football content. We'll keep it up this week. So eventually we'll get some dolphin contact content. There we go again. Content with the boys. So that's it for today's episode, folks. Thanks for stopping by. Once again, Alan Summerton signing off here for another FSU loss. Have a good one, folks. We'll catch you next time here on 305 Insights.